interviewing Professor Kevin Anderson of the Tyndall Centre. So, you're out of a job. <laughs> or, sh or should I say you're taking a sabbatical. Yes. Why? I think I'd come to a point where I recognised that if I was going to have any significant contribution, as much as any, as any one person can have, to change the pathway that we're, that we're on at the moment in terms of climate change, and particularly in terms of emissions and reducing those emissions, I need to be, be more full-time on that agenda. And obviously if you work within the university, although the university has, and particularly the school I'm in here, have given me quite a lot of freedom, nevertheless there are still a lot of other requirements of, of a functioning academic that take away your time from engaging in these, these sort of other sets of issues that I think it's important for me to, to engage in, particularly uh, in the run-up to what, what I hope will be an important outcome from the uh, Paris negotiations in December 2015. I mean, uh, as it looks at the moment, uh, all is out there to play for. Um, but undoubtedly, unless people are prepared to put a lot of effort in pushing that process very hard, and that is not, that's not just in December 2015, that's between now and then, and particularly over the next six to nine months, then I think that what will happen is that we'll get something that's a relatively damp squib a little bit like what came, that, that, that came out of Copenhagen and that, and that, from a planetary point of view, from a human point of view, we can't afford to do that. We have to have some very uh, um, stringent goals and targets and action, more important than anything else, that comes out of 2015. And, and I want to have the next 15 months or 14 months as it is now, trying to make my small contribution to that process. So let's take this United Nations process back. Uh, 1988 the IPCC is formed and then they have to create the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change to deal with the politics rather than the science. Yes. Yeah. So in Rio in 1992 an agreement is signed by all of the governments including the ones we now sort of paint as the climate villains, the United States and Australia and the deal there is that they're going to return uh, emissions to 1990 levels by 2000 mm. Then they go eventually to Kyoto and they get a much smaller mm. deal that includes um, carbon trading at the behest of the Americans. Then the Australians and the uh, Americans pull out. Uh, then they all go to uh, Copenhagen after their two-year roadmap and doesn't really go very well. So I suppose two questions. What can an optimist hope will come out of Paris and what can a realist hope? And what's the gap between what we need and what we're likely to get? Well, oh, there's quite a lot of questions to unpack in that. Um, what a realist and an optimist can hope for actually are the same thing. The difference between the two are the probabilities, you know, the likelihood of those occurring. Anyone, anyone who is familiar with the science and understands the politics and understands the, the way we are living our lives in terms of carbon um, across the globe, not just in the industrialised West but also other parts of the world as well, understands the, they will then understand the, the scale of the challenge that we're actually facing. The optimists will go into Paris and hopefully you know, in the process leading up to Paris with a much more upbeat view of we, we can achieve this and actually we've got a good likelihood of coming out with a decent um, outcome from the from the negotiations, a realist will go in, and, and I put myself more in the second category. Certainly not a pessimist, not an, not an optimist, but a realist. I think the chances of, chances of us doing anything significant in Paris are incredibly slim. I think the chances of us ever dealing with climate change, other than in a chaotic um, adaptation to the process, are very slim indeed. But they are not zero. And the whole purpose of people working this, in this agenda is not, as the sceptics might have it, for us to make lots of money and have a good time. It's actually because we are genuinely committed, because we think this is a very important issue. Um, I think it's an important issue that we will fail to make sufficient progress on. But nevertheless, if we don't try, we will definitely fail. So I'm going in there with real hope that we can come out with something that is really worthwhile, but in full recognition that the chances of that happening are incredibly slim. And that's also something we have to bear in mind in that we can't put all of the eggs in that basket. I don't think we can only rely on international negotiations and these grand events that occur every year. Uh, we, have to, we have to look at every other level. Now whether that other level is our own home, in our institution, um, in our own countries or in, in bilateral agreements between different, between different countries and different regions, whatever, whatever 
we can get involved with, we should try. Because I don't think, or I, think I, I am sure, that we do not know how to resolve this problem. We do not know what scale um, we need to approach this problem and that will trigger larger um, mobilisation of, of interest. Um, at, at eventually at a bigger and then eventually a global scale. So whether it is the major official negotiations that occur every year or whether in fact it's because a country stands up and actually does show some leadership or indeed that institutions or organisations or companies within a country start to actually show some, some leadership themselves then that might trigger and catalyse a series of events that bring about slowly but but it has to be reasonably quick now because we don't have a lot of time, but it will trigger and catalyse a wide array of people to join in that hopefully then will lead into policymakers feeling um, more empowered to bring about the sorts of um, adjustments that they, can, they, that they can make themselves. But I think we have to go in <coughs> to Paris in 2015 realistic about these issues and not thinking that that is the only way that we can resolve these problems. Learning from Copenhagen's hype then... Yes, yes, certainly learning from the hype. I mean, there, there are lots of good things about building things up as well. I mean, that you, you, you're putting a lot more momentum behind the process, but there's also a risk there. Then, of course, is that, that you know, what happened in Copenhagen could occur again in Paris. I think from, from looking at what's happening in terms of the run-up to it, it seems a slightly more mature process at the moment anyway. I think it is actually moving in a, in a more hopeful direction with a bit more realism wrapped around it. But also, of course, Copenhagen was 2009. We're now in 2014, and climate change is a cumulative problem. We have a lot more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now than we had back in Cop when we went um, to Copenhagen. The problem is many times more challenging than it was then. We've lost that opportunity to make the changes we could make. So now we face something where we are, we, I, I did say at the time, we were sort of on the cusp in, 20, in 2009, but it was on the cusp to make changes that were, that were were very significant, but ones we could sort of fit into the current system. I think now we're really having to beg very fundamental questions about the system that within which we have to make these changes. That can the system that we operate within and under, can that deliver the rates of change? Um, I think is, is, is probably looking like it can't anymore. And therefore we have to look at things that are much more fundamental. And they, they in themselves take a lot of time. Um, and the time is the enemy here, is we, we don't have this time or opportunity. To, to make a small adjustments with the hope that in 10 or 20 or 30 years time we can bring about significant change. We, we've left it so late we are really talking about 2030 being the, the end of us doing anything very significant and we have to have made the adjustments really by then which means we have to start making those adjustments at very significant levels now. This changes everything. Two more questions yes, about, about Paris. <clears throat> so someone's watching this video and they're already a member of Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, they already recycle and they think I like Kevin Anderson and I want to support him in his efforts to make a change with, with Paris. Maybe they live in Manchester, maybe they live in Adelaide, somewhere else in the world. What kind of hope, help rather, what kind of help are you looking for? I don't know if I'm looking for any help directly from individuals or collectives anywhere. I mean, if people want to engage with the sorts of arguments that I'm making, that's, that's, that's well and good. What all of us who think this is a very serious issue need to do, firstly, is to, is to quite quickly re-examine why do we think it's a serious issue, to remind ourselves of why we think this is important, so that we are always... We don't rely on the sceptics or other people questioning us. We are questioning ourselves all the time. I think it's really important to be... Um, to, to reflect on why we are, why we take the positions that we take. And then if we still think this is really an important issue, and, and, I, and I, I do this process, go through this process quite regularly myself, to sort of question why it is that I'm saying the things that I'm actually saying that are quite uncomfortable to say. Um, if, we, if we can still justify that then, I think we have to, what we need to be able to do is to communicate this, this the seriousness of the message to a much wider audience to get greater buy-in to these sets of issues. And we can do that, in, and there are many ways of, of doing that, and it's, it's certainly not my, not my area of expertise to know how we should communicate these issues. I, as an academic, I can't see what's wrong with, with PowerPoint presentations and, and a few graphs and some numbers, but clearly that's not the way forward. So people do it through lots of different means. Now whether, yeah, and, and I think you have, to, you have to play to your strengths in actually doing that. But we also, in, in doing that, we have to, we have to I, I personally take this view, and I know lots of people disagree with me on this, that we have to show some examples ourselves and how we live our lives, 
about the sorts of changes that we're requiring of others. I think simply to say these are the sorts of changes that other people out there must make. You know, we are all part of the problem. And I think we, we have to be very careful not to come across as we, you know, we're the arrogant ones that know how to solve this problem and other people out there, the little people out there, which need to bring them on board and get them to make changes to their lives. We, have to, we are part of the problem. The way that we as, as academics, as NGOs, as, um, as people who are really interested, interested in these issues within businesses, as we pursue these agendas ourselves, at the moment we're not showing any sign of significant change in how we would do those sorts of operations, how we would live our lives and continue our jobs in a lower carbon fashion. And I think we have to demonstrate that in trying to drive a, a wider set of actions. Um, the other thing I think is really important that, that we have to develop narratives that are attractive to, to all, all walks of life. And there's a, very, there's a very clear narrative that, if you like, leans towards the left, that sees climate change as an issue that is that was almost, is almost politicised between left and right. And I don't think it is appropriate to see it like that. This is, this is a human problem. It's a planetary problem. And I think what we, what we need to do is find narratives that actually are much more appealing to those that lean a little bit to the right as well. So that we try to get everyone on board, as, as many people as we can get on board with this agenda. At the moment there is a risk that it sounds like it's a, it's a, a problem that also, or some people may even argue that this is the case. It's been manufactured to some extent to to make a political case. I don't think it's like that at all. I think we have a, a genuine, genuinely serious issue that at the moment the way that we're trying to respond to it looks like the sorts of policies we have to put in place are ones that traditionally would have been seen as sort of left-wing policies. I think we have to find ways to embrace um, the, the, more, the more sort of caring, compassionate side of people that, who, who lean a little bit to the right. And actually I think if we can get them on board, um, I think that, that they are often very vociferous people, they are, they are well networked, um, and they could really drive, uh, drive change. So I think we have to, have to almost park some of our political concerns that we, may, that we may have and actually see this agenda as over and above that. It's more important for us to, to deal with climate change than it is to deal with these, these other sets of ideologies, if you like. Um, having said that, I think it's also worth bearing in mind at the moment, it does appear that the policies we need to put in place are ones whereby the, the, the sorts of techniques that the right would traditionally use where we have tried those, they have failed to succeed. Um, and I think that's an interesting, an, an interesting outcome that we started these problems, started addressing these problems back in 1990 and in many respects if we had addressed them those, in those days using the tools of the right, if you like, the, the normal sort of price mechanisms, carbon trading, the sorts of things that, that started to emerge, if we pushed those things quite hard we could, probably could have made it what would have been, at those, in those days, the, the sort of large but nevertheless incremental adjustments that would be necessary to bring about um, a lower car much lower carbon society. That was 24 years ago we started doing these things and since then emissions have gone up by 60-65% and those show no signs of coming down. So in a sense the tools that were being pushed by the right at the time simply have failed. They have not succeeded. They have not even succeeded really in, in changing the rate of growth as far as we can see in emissions. The rate of growth now is higher than it was then. And therefore, actually, as, as we've failed with these tools, the ones that are sort of less interventionist in some respects, then I think, as it's a cumulative problem, the more that they fail, the more you have to be more interventionist. So we've come to a position today, in 2014, with the carbon budgets that are laid out by the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for 2 degrees C, that those carbon budgets are so tight that they require a lot of state intervention to bring about... Um, the, re the changes in society to remain within those budgets. So I think there's been a natural process which means that the policies have moved from, from right-leaning policies to left-leaning policies. But I don't think that's a, that's a comment on the politics, that's just a comment on the timing that we, that we haven't dealt with this problem earlier. There's a lot in there and uh, I think you'll get some uh, pushback on some of what you've said, which is fine, it's part of the debate. Final question on Paris. You're there. You've got your accreditation, and guess what? You get stuck in a lift with Angela and Vladimir and Barack and Xi Jinping and Narendra Modi, and you've got 45 seconds. Oh, the lift. The, the elevator pitch. The pitch yeah. I, th I think you may have asked me this once before, and uh, um, <laughs> I should have worked out a better answer by now. Um, I don't think you, in the lift, you've got 45 seconds. I don't think you can appeal to their heads. I think you've got to appeal to their hearts if you've got 45 seconds. 
Um, and that's probably the approach that I would try to take with some significant language barriers if, if there's that particular group in the lift. Um, so I think you've got to bring it down to, it. if that's all the time you've got, you've got to bring it down to a human level, you've got to bring it down to a human level that they can engage with, which probably, probably means, I would think, their own families, but also their legacy. As leaders, well, most of us want to leave a good legacy behind, and as leaders, definitely what, they, what they're interested in is, is how history will, will view them. So I think to bring that in um, and, and play through it you know, play, play to their heart rather than their heads if all I've got is 45 seconds. Next time I ask you, I'll give you five minutes. Yeah, okay. to, uh, it's stuck in the lift. I think I've probably covered it. We've probably covered everything reasonably there. Um, yeah, I just remember Paris is only, what, 14 months away? Something like that. Um, and for any of us who think this is important for academics, for business leaders, for politicians, for NGOs, activists and so forth, we have a very limited amount of time to drive change and we mustn't think this is going to happen in the December in 2015. It's going to be happening between now and next summer really. So we really we have a short wind of opportunity to put as much pressure, much force, um, as much support, as much innovative ideas and, and solutions and um, put them on the table for other people in the negotiations to take forward and try and drive a significant global deal in 2015. As I said, I think the chances are very slim, but if we don't try, then the chances are zero.